I'd say for most people, find something else to do other than breeding dogs if you're looking for a business idea. Because this is a really good way of losing money and becoming a mad dog woman. Puppies in the house. You can hear them in the cut there. Lots of people do it every year. But what does it take? And just how crazy do you have to be? Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. On today's episode, we ask what it takes to become a dog breeder. We'll learn about the hours of research, the unexpected costs, and the challenges of starting a breeding program. Plus, we'll hear about the pregnant bitch who delivered a Christmas surprise for one breeder. Yes, you're going to hear that word a lot, but we mean it in the most kind way. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's go for a walk. Because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey Pepper, want to go for a walk? So Claire, let's tackle the elephant in the room, the really big hairy dog. (laughs) Some people think that we should not be breeding dogs at all because there are still animals that need to be rescued. So why are we doing a show on this and discussing breeding? Yeah, Jim, I think it's really important that we tackle this right at the start because it's something that a lot of people feel very passionate about, rescuing dogs from shelters. And I've had three dogs. One was from a rescue shelter, one was from a backyard breeder, and one was from what we would call a responsible breeder. So I have seen both sides of this. And I think it's important that we start with some thoughts from the experts. So Rebecca Waters runs Pup Starts, which is a training provider for breeders. Of course, if you have a suitable home environment and the skills and the knowledge and the ability to look after a rescue dog, then that should be your first port of call, in my opinion. However, not everybody does. Beverly Cuddy is the editor of Dogs Today and a campaigner for responsible breeding. She makes some really good points about this too. If we say nobody breed, the only people who will breed will be the people who break the rules. And the people who break the rules are the puppy farmers, the importers and the void will be filled with more and more of the bad breeding. And how do the assistance dogs charities source their puppies if no one breeds? Okay, so we need breeders and we need good ones. So if you're going to become a breeder, I guess the first thing to decide on is what type of breed are you going to breed? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that's not straightforward. What you might love might not be what other people want as a pet. What? I think everyone wants a Maltese, no? (laughs) Well, maybe. And the flip side of that is that what's really popular right now Mm. might not be the best dog to get into breeding long term. Here's how Beverly and Rebecca look at it. Definitely stay away from fads. Think of the dog that you love and you would want to spend your life with and fall in love with the dog yourself and live it and breathe it before you dare bring any more into the world. If you are breeding a particular breed of dog, it should be because you're passionate about improving the breed and it should be because you're passionate about their long-term health and well-being. So you need to think long and hard about the breed that you love and Maybe it's the animal that you already have at home, but maybe it's not and you're starting afresh. So often you have to start with, here's that term again, a breeding bitch. And it's not that easy to get one, is it? No. And Beverly Cuddy sums this up really nicely. If you're a breeder who's a good breeder and someone comes to you saying, I want to buy one of your puppies and I want to then breed from it, they will go, the door is over there. Please leave immediately. (laughs) (laughs) Because, of course, the breeders have invested a lot of time in producing these puppies and they don't want someone to just take that line of dogs and do whatever they want to do with it in an inexperienced way. So Vicky Rutherford runs Nook Online Labrador Breeders in Cumbria in the UK. You know, the breeding environment is a very close shop. It is difficult to, to get hold of good quality animals to be able to breed from. It is. There's no two ways about it. And just to complicate things, I guess this isn't just about finding the nearest breeder or the one that is having puppies soonest. 
If you are dedicated to a breed, you are probably going to want to improve it as well. Yes, you'll be looking for specific breed characteristics. Um, My dog Maple came from a breeder in Canada called Tiff Murray, and she had a really clear vision of the kind of golden retriever that she wants to breed. And after she did a load of research, she ended up importing her dogs from Brazil. Brazil. So we're lacking a lot of certain things in the breed itself here. I found the breeder I wanted to work with through Facebook, but that was after talking to and chatting with like hundreds of different breeders all over Canada, all over the States, breeders in Europe, all kinds of breeders. I spent a long time looking. Hundreds of different breeders. (laughs) Hundreds. Yeah. It's a lot. So I have so much trust in with this breeder in a different country And then I had to trust the shipping guy. And there's nobody going to send dogs without some money already, you know, being involved. There's just no way. I wouldn't do it either. So I had to pay for the dog. And then I had to pay half to the shipper and then pay the rest when he came. So, Jim, you start to realize how dedicated breeders are and the research that they do along the process is just amazing. Tiff has imported four dogs from Mm. Brazil now for her breeding program, and she even went there herself to bring the last one back, which was actually her first time on a commercial aircraft and her first time leaving Canada. Wow. Imagine the lengths one will go to, literally, to find that perfect dog. Well, here at Team Dog, we have our own breeder. Her name is Kate Baysdow. She is a producer. She produces another podcast on Dog Podcast Network. And she breeds the Belgian Tavernin. And so we spoke to Kate about the kind of research that she does before she starts. When I'm planning and researching for a litter, My goal is to produce healthy, sound puppies that are going to thrive in their homes doing whatever it is that their owners want to do. But I also want them to cosmetically match the ideal of the standard and be as beautiful according to our breed standard as possible. So, and aiming for the total picture is not easy. So responsible breeders don't just put two attractive looking dogs together and wait for the puppies. (laughs) What? All the way along, they are researching and planning, sometimes several generations down the line, trying to create the perfect of that breed. And of course, there's health testing too, so you can make sure you aren't going to create puppies with inherited health issues. So those genetic risks that Kate was talking about, things that can happen when you breed dogs poorly, maybe like, you know, hip dysplasia, Those are not the only things that you have to worry about when you find the perfect parents. Yeah, you thinking about double merles. Yes. What I understand about merles is the name was given to the malted coloring that you see on Australian shepherds and dachshunds and border collies, I think. And it's really attractive to look at, but it's more than just the beauty. Yeah, if you breed two merles, who are these really attractive dogs, there is then a 25% chance that the puppies will be born as double merles. And a double merle is no good because it means that they are likely to be deaf or blind or both. Yeah, absolutely. So you get a scenario where people are taking two attractive looking dogs and think we'll get lots of attractive puppies and they don't understand how the genes work. So this is why All good dog breeders do the research and the genetic testing before they pair dogs together. So as you say, it's not just about finding a really attractive mom and a really attractive dad and and hoping beautiful babies happen. Mm -mm. Yeah. The breeders go online, they do their research, they try and find a good dad for the pups who are going to bring in the right genetic input to the mother's line. And most times, most times, that is a live dog who they can meet in person and sniff and smell and explore. (laughs) But sometimes they use more artificial methods, artificial insemination. Here's Kate to describe that. So my foundation bitch, Queasel, had two litters. Her first one was actually with frozen semen. And that dog was alive, but he was much older at that point. And so we used frozen. We have also one of our litters in... I think they were in 2017, was with frozen semen from a dog that had been dead 10 years. 
And of course, it has to be said that if you go down this route to parenthood, whether you are a human or a dog, it's not straightforward. You need to be doing progesterone testing ahead of time to make sure your timing is spot on because you want the sperm in there a little bit before the bitch ovulates so that the timing's right. Because otherwise you've spent a couple thousand dollars just kind of throwing it away. Yeah, there's a cost to that. We're going to get into that. But sometimes breeders will try and cover all the bases to ensure that they have puppies in the first place. People will sometimes do dual sired litters where they're hoping for puppies from the frozen or fresh chilled sample, but they also really want to have a litter. So they use a live male at the same time. And so for those, you have to DNA test the puppies in order to register. Now, we've talked a lot about the science side of this, but there is something much more fundamental, which is that you have to have a bitch who is going to make a good mother. Now, Kate had a really sobering story to tell about what can go wrong if you force motherhood onto the wrong dog. My mother is a veterinarian, and she had one client years ago who had this awful, nasty little dog, just not a nice dog, but the owners wanted to breed a litter. And she told him, like, if you want to breed a litter, that's fine. Please don't do it with this dog. They did it anyway. And she started killing the puppies. And that's a very stressed dog that will do that. And they then had to hand rear those puppies. Hmm. And after the first puppy that she killed, they called the vet because it's horrifying when your dog is killing her puppies. And she said, you're going to have to take them away from her and hand raise them now. And bottle feeding is a hard job. That's like every two hours around the clock, feeding them, cleaning them, stimulating them to urinate and defecate, and doing everything that the mother dog should be doing. That is now your job. With all this time, research, and money put into creating a pregnancy, even if you're going about it the conventional way, the non-frozen way, it is no surprise to discover that for a breeder, there are big changes to the whole family routine and things that you need to do from the moment of conception. Once she has been bred, the house is on lockdown. None of the dogs are going out and about in the community or to shows, certainly not the hopefully pregnant mother, because we don't want to bring any diseases or illnesses in because pregnant mother has a lowered immune system so she's more susceptible to any illnesses that are going around, and we don't want any risk to her or hopefully the puppies. We're going to take a quick break right here, but before we do, to get you to stick around till we come back from the break, I want to ask you a question. How many months does a bitch take to have its litter? We asked some people in dog parks around the world to see what they thought. Or five. I don't know. Four? Four? Twelve. Oh, five. Six months? The answer is coming up after the break. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpuff. The green, grassy, beef liver spike smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpuff, traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. It helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day, because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want my Everpup. It just makes me feel good. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the Everpup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. 
Ever pup every day. Before the break, we found out why breeders are important, and we looked at researching genetic histories and using artificial insemination for dogs. And we asked you how many months a dog's pregnancy lasts. <laughs> and the answer was roughly two months or 63 days. After which point there's a beautiful, serene picture postcard birth, right? Here's Rebecca Waters from Pop Starts. If I had to pick an area, I think the actual birth is the thing that causes breeders the most anxiety. Maybe it's the first time you've ever seen your dog in pain. People really struggle with that. I have to admit, I've had two children and I never even thought about the fact that a dog who is birthing puppies might actually be in pain. It's obvious really, isn't it? Mm. And there is a lot of anxiety that breeders can feel, not just about the pain that the dog is feeling during the birthing process, but all the stuff they have to have in their home prior to the birth. Here's Vicky. You need a, somewhere to whelp the puppies, vet bedding, replacement milk, bottles, puppy stim, and liver water in case the puppies are a little bit quiet and they, they just need a little bit of a boost. You need scales, you'll need nail clippers, calcium tablets, lubricant thermometer, umbilical scissors, camera and monitor, stimulating toys. I have a Google app for the socialisation, TV, rubber matting, feeders, collars. The list is endless. <laughs> I must admit I didn't understand all of those things or the purpose of all of those things, Claire. <laughs> Maybe it's best if you don't. <laughs> okay. Vicky did stress that most of the items you need, you won't actually need. You just have to be prepared to have them and I guess be prepared to know how to use them just in case. And then the puppies are born. And although you aren't the mum, Beverly Cuddy says it is just like having a newborn in the house. Hmm. It's a huge change to your routine to spend eight weeks solid of um, rearing a litter of puppies. And it, whilst it is great fun if you do it really, really well, um, you won't be able to do anything else. <laughs> and most people don't have lives that they can do, switch on and off like that. Vicky Rutherford is a massage therapist and she stops work for several months when she has a litter. It affects the family in a huge way. I am basically on the sofa next to the puppies for four weeks. So I don't go to bed for four weeks. My whole routine is dedicated to those puppies as soon as they are here. I can't leave the house. I can't do any other work. I just need to be watching the puppies, making sure they don't get squashed, making sure the feeding, making sure everything's okay. So Vicky spends four weeks dedicated to just taking care of these puppies and, and foregoing her own sleep. Rebecca also says that people misunderstand how much time is needed to look after the little puppies and the mom and the dad. You hear people going, oh my God, I'm exhausted. I'm absolutely exhausted. You know, we've not been able to leave the house. We've been waiting for her to have these puppies and then, then the puppies have arrived and we're going to have to bottle feed some of them and they need feeding every hour, 24 hours a day. And then you've got eight to 12 weeks of care and it's full on. It's really full on. Of course, you're going to have to find homes for these puppies eventually. And many breeders say that that process will start before the litter is even conceived with a waiting list of prospective new owners. You'll also need a questionnaire and you'll need to think about deposits. As we are approaching that part of breeding where money changes hands, it seems sensible to talk about the financial side of breeding. Now, of course, during the pandemic, the prices that some people were paying for puppies went through the roof. And even in normal times, you can be looking at four figures. Mm. So you can see why people think it's a moneymaker. But here's what Kate said. I have not added it up for a single litter because I really don't want to know. <laughs> there have been breeders who have calculated out the price to actually cover all the expenses that go into health testing, raising the dogs, all the blood work for the progesterone testing. If you're doing AI, that adds up the cost. And then if you factor in the breeder's time as well, 
really what we should be charging for puppies is like ten to fifteen thousand dollars per puppy to cover time and investment. <laughs> Kate, no, 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 no. We'll have to have a chat conversation about that. Uh, that that just shows you that the four thousand dollar dogs are are underpriced. Hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? It is, and you can see why someone would think that because it is a lot of out of pocket expense, and then factoring in their time, and then the commitment. Some people don't sleep for a month. I mean, that's tough. <laughs> it's amazing. Here's Beverly Cuddy's take. I think the very best breeders are working for well below minimum wage if they dared work it out. When we spoke with our breeders about all the unexpected costs that they incur, one of the ones that was high on the list, especially folks in the UK, was the cost of energy. I had a very large electricity bill last year in the colder months. At all times, you must maintain your puppy's temperature. So we have a number of heat lamps. I didn't quite realise the cost of the lamps, but to be fair, it would have been irrelevant anyway because the puppies needed to be kept warm. So that that was a a big shock. (laughs) And Kate made the very sensible point that you need to have some money aside in case of medical emergencies related to the birth. Anyone breeding a litter must have money budgeted for a C-section got to be prepared in case something goes wrong and the bitch either isn't delivering the puppies or is struggling halfway through. And for a C-section, ideally you want to have like $2,000 set aside just in case. You need to be able to act immediately to save her life and the lives of your puppies. So that's another $2,000 that you have to have on top of everything else just in case. So you go through the process, the puppy is now 8 to 12 weeks old, which is the right age to go off and be adopted into a new home, and the breeder has done the questionnaires and done the research to find out if it's a perfect fit, but sometimes it gets a little more complicated than that. Here's Kate. I've had some people who've contacted us about puppies over the years where there was really nothing wrong on paper, but I just got a bad feeling, and... Each time it has later turned out that I was right in redirecting and saying, sorry, we don't have a puppy for you. Really good breeders have that sixth sense, that intuition. And I think it's really important when you talk to a breeder that the breeder is really scrutinizing you to see that this is a good home for you because they do have that sixth sense. And Beverly says the process is fraught with difficulties. So what Beverly's really saying there is that your standards will be so high because you've mm. nurtured these puppies for eight to 12 weeks and everybody who comes along good isn't going to be puppies. quite, yeah, they're not going to be quite good enough. But, you know, you can't hold on to all the puppies. You will eventually have to rehome them. Now, the thing that's always worried me about having puppies, and this is because this is just my personality, I'm always thinking far too far into the future, is I worry that puppies naturally have a shelf life. And if you can't rehome them by that 12 weeks, they do start to become less appealing to new homes and harder to rehome. Yeah, that is a reality that some breeders have to deal with. And they do it by making sure that there is sufficient demand for this type of dog before they even start. Now, Hope Rescue is a fantastic shelter in Clanheron in Wales. And They were recently in the news here in the UK after taking in a litter of puppies from a breeder that got to that 12-week point and couldn't find homes for them. We get quite a lot of unplanned litters coming in. So people who are ill-prepared, they didn't realise how much it would cost, the time commitment needed if you're going to rear puppies properly. We've also just had a litter of Springer Spaniel puppies came in. Really nice puppies, been bred in a lovely environment. They're vaccinated, well socialised, good conditioned puppies. The breeder just could not sell those puppies. They'd sold a couple to friends and thankfully, rather than keep reducing the price and going to less suitable homes, they responsibly surrendered them to us instead. For most breeders, your responsibility to the puppies that you bring into the world does not end when you hand over the dog. Here's Kate. Stand by your puppies. When you breed a litter, you are bringing lives into the world and they should not be disposable You need to stand by them for whatever might go wrong in their lives. All of my puppies are sold on a contract 
which says that if something happens to the owner or they're unable or no longer want to keep the puppy for any reason throughout their lives, the puppy should either be returned to me or I should at least be contacted so we can figure out the best place for that dog to go. Tiff Murray in Canada knows this principle well. She has had to step in to help with rehoming two puppies, including one of Maple's litter mates. Mm. There's only been two times that I had puppies returned. Everything seemed okay, but when they got the puppy home after a few days, they just, they were not mentally prepared for the amount of work that it takes. And thankfully, they contacted me, which is exactly what they're supposed to do, and let me know that this is going on. And of course, I'm not going to be upset or angry. I mean, it is what it is. I don't want the puppy to stay in that situation. And then the second time was a little bit trickier. It was more of an emotional thing because... That family took the puppy for the purpose of therapy. The wife had some anxiety. So that was supposed to help her, but instead it actually exacerbated it. So this lady was just really, really overwhelmed, couldn't handle it. So again, they contacted me. This time we physically brought the puppy back here and they were so emotional. They were very attached. I was even in tears when they left. It was really, really difficult and on all fronts. So far, we have learned that breeding involves about four months of your life where you basically surrender everything you're doing to this one venture. Oh, yeah. And you're hemorrhaging a lot of money in the process. And then there's the small matter of 12 to 15 years where you have to be on call to take an additional dog into your home at any point. It's really an easy call, right? (laughs) I'm just so grateful, Jim, that we have people who are dedicated to giving puppies this kind of healthy start. Me too. So we love our breeders. We love our responsible breeders. So speaking of dedication, and these breeders are really dedicated We thought we would include a little tale from Rebecca Walters, which sums up the commitment of breeders and how having puppies in the house really can pretty much take over everything. A few years ago, I had a bitch who was pregnant and she was due prior to Christmas. We looked at the calendar, we got it all organised. We had the family coming over, 14 family members coming over on this particular Christmas. And, you know, I'm running around on Christmas morning stressing out because I've got all these people coming and I've got to lay the table and we've got to cook the turkey and we've got to do this and sorting the kids out, sorting the dogs out. And I'd be fretting because she'd not had these puppies and not had these puppies. And when do you think she decided that she was going to have this litter of puppies? So I'm on my hands and knees in the utility room whelping this bitch and she's having her puppies while my husband is freaking out about getting the roast potatoes crispy and the Yorkshire pudding just right on Christmas day and um it was absolute carnage and that is just typical of it the rest of the family were like oh it's always the dogs it's always the dogs you know and I'm absent <laughs> and doing something else with the dogs Yorkshire pudding and whelping puppies that is a vivid image that is going to live in my head Well, that is all the time we have for today. I want to encourage you to check out the show notes where you can find links to and contact information for all the experts who appeared in today's show. We also have some helpful pointers for training and health check resources in today's show notes. And don't forget to follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app. Or on YouTube. And check out our sister shows, including The Long Leash with James Jacobson at dogpodcastnetwork.com. I'm Claire Mansell. And I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.